Sounds good. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to One Quantum Africa. Weekly meetings, they are hosted by me, Farai Majandu. I'm the president for One Quantum Africa chapter. Uh, One, Quantum is, uh, One Quantum Africa is a chapter of One Quantum, which is a global uh, community which brings together people who are active and interested in, in quantum tech. And it's, it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you here. So today we've got a special guest, a uh, guest that we, was not new to us at One Quantum, who is not new to us in terms of community. And it's really, really a pleasure. We never knew that we were going to get such a day, but uh, it has been made possible. So today we've got Manish Tapa, uh, he's a quantum engineer at IQM Quantum Computers, and he's going to share with us his journey into quantum computing. It's always special and interesting to hear how people end up in quantum computing. It's a new field, it hasn't been there all along, and it is open for everyone to come through. And each and every one of us has got a unique journey into it, which gives us very beautiful lessons about what is possible. So it's really a pleasure to have Manish today. So before Manish comes through, I'm going to go through a few slides and to do what I call pay the bills, uh, and just to give you guys a solid understanding of what One Quantum Africa is all about and what One Quantum is all about, what kind of opportunities we are creating for people each and every day, and how you can take advantage of those opportunities as well and make them yours. Um, so let me see. Okay, so I usually want to begin by a justification because quantum is new and being new, sometimes we, we sometimes don't think that it is for everyone. But uh, the truth of the matter is quantum is for everyone. And we have already been using technologies that are based on quantum physics. It's only that our understanding of quantum physics has deepened. Uh, the level of engineering has also improved or uh, people have figured out how to build devices that we can make use of today. Some of them are already delivering uh, value. Some of them are still you know, improving each and every day, like in quantum computing. Um, so because of these new capabilities, we always have a wave of new technologies coming through and quantum is far reaching in terms of uh, extent and impact. It is uh, has potential to uh, affect almost every industry. As we you may have learned when you were coming for these sessions or joining other community sessions elsewhere. So given that we already have got a technology that have been based on quantum physics, the current developments that we see in that space where we can control individual atoms and you know, allow them to communicate and work together when we want them to, and sometimes you know, remove that relationship and take up on them, allowing us to you know, find a control, um, will give us the capabilities to solve what could be some of the world's um, uh, biggest problems. Which classical computers are not currently able to deal with and may not be able to deal with uh, for a very, very long time. So in Africa, we've got a lot of young people, I give at least 60 to 65% are young people that are talented, energetic, looking for opportunities to grow, you know, and they, we've got a lot of natural resources in the continent, and yet we still remain behind in terms of development. I want to call those opportunities so we've got a lot of opportunities in the continent for growth, which makes us a very important place as a market for the world and also a very important place in terms of building future skills. So to build, to give these people a capabilities to contribute and to shape the new enterprises and the future careers and the future workforce we envisage that is going to make quantum possible or that is going to ride on the development of quantum technologies, it is necessary to bring people together, to collaborate, to exchange ideas and to figure out how we can take advantage of this technology to build solutions that are relevant to the continent, to our communities. And for that reason, we need everyone uh, from policymakers, from the civic society, from business, from research, 
um, and uh, investors to come together so that we figure out how we can leapfrog and uh, develop very fast, which is what advantage, another advantage we have in Africa. We can learn from what other countries have gone through. We can pick only the best, we can cherry pick and pick only the best uh, outcomes, implement them, make them ours and solve problems that are important to us. One quantum Africa is our effort to bring a community together <clears throat> and make these conversations find a ground, find a foundation on which to build upon. Um, briefly, let me tell you about uh, One Quantum. Uh, so One Quantum is a global community, but being a global community is structured in such a way that we believe it is important to build strong local communities. And also, when we build those strong local communities, we give them access to education, that is content education. We give them access to mentorship. We give them access to opportunities. It could be uh, internships, it could be stipends, you name it, to just enable people to take practical steps in terms of developing quantum capabilities, or also that they are able to contribute to the quantum field in a meaningful way. When we do that, we also, believe that it is important to connect these local communities to a global community, because that is how we create opportunities for everyone. So the world is now more connected. COVID has accelerated that connectivity and that connection amongst us as a people, which allows us to do so many things. And for one, that is the reason why we have got this platform today and it is thriving because working online, connecting from wherever we are is now more like a new normal. So we've got projects, where we have collaborated with Strange Works. I think some of you managed to join us last week. We had Caesar presenting on their platform. We are going to announce many more exciting things as we go. We've got uh, a career aspect uh, that we focus on where you can submit your CVs to us. We've got career partners we're working with. We're able, we'll be able to look at your CV and guide you. And if that is not enough, then we've got mentoring as well where you are connected with professionals in quantum and beyond in order to help you to professionally grow. So that is something that can happen beyond the community. Um, may you please mute yourself, thank you. So let me tell you briefly about One Quantum Africa Summit. So we've got a, a summit that is coming, that is on um, May 12 and 13. Uh, we talked about the unitary fund coming through to support us and uh, just to share briefly about what they are working on and something, an opportunity that many of you may be excited about. The unitary fund is hosting a first quantum open source hackathon, which has got swag and bounties from May 14 to 30th. And they are eager to give a lot of cash and uh, they've uh, assured me that they are so, so eager to find participants from Africa. We have not been participating so much and they will be happy to, to see us participating more. And there are opportunities for you there to get uh, some cash, to get some digital swag and to get much more. Uh, beyond that, for our own summit, I'm happy to say everything is coming uh, into place. The summit is secured and it will happen. Yes, there are still a few things that we're touching up on. But we are happy to welcome Bob Suter from IBM. Some of you may know him. He's a tech executive, world-renowned in quantum. He's been there in the game for more than 30 years. He works at IBM. I think he has a new title now, uh, the chief quantum exponent or something. I'm not sure you can check his LinkedIn profile to see those updates. And we've got Lesed Modise. Some of you may have joined us when she came through. Uh, she did a brilliant presentation on how Africa can take advantage of quantum technologies today. Francesco Petrocini is not new to you, he's a quantum leader in Africa. Morad Delmini, Asira, Ismaili, Andrew Forbes, Mahin Zakangombe from Zambia, he works for the United Nations. So it will be an interesting perspective to learn from uh, how he has been looking at technology from outside and what we can do in Africa. Uh, to, to take this forward. <clears throat> there are many more. I just took a, a few of them. Uh, I want to encourage you to take advantage of the mentorship program that we have in place. I'm sorry, the introduction is going to be a bit long, but I think it's important that I share this information with you. That's the reason why we have, we have the community, so that people find tangible opportunities to grow. The mentorship program is closing end of this month, 
And I'm not happy with the number of people that have submitted their CVs from Africa to for, for the career fair, for example, and those that have also enrolled for the um, mentorship program. It's open, it's free. There's no upfront requirement. So there's no reason for you guys not to take advantage of it. You never know who you are going to be connected with. These are quantum tech leaders, uh, business leaders, executives. And I, I guess, you know, a network is just important for each and every one of us. And I know you will find ways of making use of that opportunity and of those networks as you build them. So I encourage you to sign up for the mentorship program. I'm going to share the links. And I also encourage you to submit your CVs. Don't hesitate, there are no upfront requirements. Just to throw your CVs into the head, just to throw your application for mentorship and you're done. So these are our other communities. One Quantum Africa where we are, for women in quantum. I think they've already announced tentative dates for their next summit, which is the fifth one. One Quantum Nepal, where Manish is also coming from and we've also been joined by guys from Nepal. We really appreciate it, thank you guys. We've got a startup chapter and we can always talk about these things more. When you connect with me on those uh, links, I will skip this one and move fast because I've already been eating into Manish's time. Uh, let me introduce our presenter today, Manish Tapa. Manish is a personal friend. I've known him before all these things, and it's really a pleasure to have seen him growing and uh, to see him where he is today and with the great work that he's doing for the community as well as to build the actual technology that we are going to use in the future. So Manish was born in a small town in the eastern part of Nepal and obtained his PhD in physics from ETH Zuri in 2020. And because of his passion to see everyone getting opportunities to get involved in quantum, he recently started leading the community in Nepal. And we are going to hear more about it from him. Our next speaker who is coming through next week is Stepan Kovac. He's a co-founder of a company called QR Crypto SA. He's a really a world-renowned uh, technologist who is an expert in quantum technology and blockchain. So I know some of you are interested in blockchain technology. I always receive a lot of questions about that. That is the guy who is going to be able to answer all your questions. So invite your whole community to come and join us next week, just like what you did this week. Um, please take advantage of the Creative Instruction Lab. They have open opportunities for you guys to apply, whether you are an individual in quantum, you have an idea of a startup, or you don't have an idea of a startup, you can join their platform, you will be connected with other people who are looking for to build opportunities in quantum, to start companies, and this is more of your accelerator, so this is more of your incubation hub, accelerator kind of setup, and I think it is based in Canada, Toronto, and it's a good opportunity if you are interested. Uh, you can connect with me and I'll share the details if you are interested. So yeah, that leaves me to stop boring you with all these introductions and paying the bills and give up time to Manish. I'm really sorry I took a lot of time there, but it's important that I share that information with you guys in person. Right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow Manish to start sharing his and come through and take it away. Okay, thank you for, I, for uh, the introduction and of course for, for the invite. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Yeah, so here you go. Do you see my slides? Uh, yes, we do see your slides, Manish. Thank you. You can go ahead. All right. All right. So I want to uh, quickly correct for I, I received my PhD not on physics, but I received it from um, physical chemistry department. So the line of research I focused during my PhD was chemical physics. So it combines both, both chemistry and physics, right? And I'll touch on that, that more. But just just to you know be be accurate right there um okay so um Farah asked me to give give this talk right when, when he first uh, reached out to me and and i was quite quite excited and i was asking him back you know what what the talks should be really about and i guess because i was struggling you know i, I didn't know much the audience and he was like, yeah, why don't you tell about your own journey right into quantum computing? And I thought that was a great idea. Um, so I'll 
do exactly that. I'll present my journey right in, into this world of quantum computing. And along the way, I will also throw in some technical details, right? So it will be sort of like a chronological uh, way to, to um, take you guys through this trajectory. And I've been into, I've been studying in different universities and, and what did I learn in, in, in these different universities and how it culminated uh, into my interest, right? To, to be in quantum computing, right? Um, so that is exactly how it will go. And towards the end, uh, I will of course talk about uh, my company, IQM Quantum Computers and what we do there, right? So uh, towards the end, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, our approach at IQM. All right, so to begin, um, so I work as a quantum engineer at IQM Quantum Computers. Um, IQM is based in two places, Finland and Germany. We have our headquarters in Finland. And I'll, I'll tell you more about the company in the later slides. And I'm also the president of One Quantum Nepal, um, which is a nonprofit initiative under One Quantum and runs similarly to uh, One Quantum uh, Africa, right? So, so we have uh, programs, very similar programs, and we, we focus on building quantum community for, for Nepalese um, so that we can make new technology like, like this one inclusive, right? For, for everybody, regardless of background or where we come from. So that was the main motivation uh, for, for, for this initiative. Now, um, to tell you a little bit of where I come from, I come from Nepal and that red country on the right, right? That is Nepal. We are situated in Southeast Asia in between India and China, India in the South and China on the North. We are a landlocked country, so we don't have access to large bodies of water. But since we are, we are a Himalayan country, right? We, we have uh, many lakes in Nepal, so, so water is not a problem. Um, now, let me give you a sense of how big uh, Nepal is, right? So what I've done here is I've overlaid map of South Africa on onto the map of Nepal. And I was Googling this the other night and, and it turns out Nepal is about eight times smaller than South Africa, right? But um, the population of Nepal is 30 million, around 30 million, 28 to 30 million, which is uh, not small. So we are pretty, that's a pretty sizable number, right? And um, you can see on the right, that's the flag of Nepal and it, it's kind of funny looking flag, uh, two triangles juxtaposed onto each other. And there are emblems right on, on top and bottom of um, uh, different um, celestial bodies, right? Different celestial bodies. And now, so so people find that funny, right? So I, I just thought I, I put it there. Um, so a little bit more about, about the country. Um, so when I think of Nepal, I, I like to imagine it being a mountainous country and it is a mountainous country with a lot of uh, mountains. Uh, we, we have a long range of Himalayas on the north. And on the right, top right, you see that is a picture I took from this mountain flight that shows you around uh, Himalayas. It takes you back and forth, right? There is no like uh, clear destination to go, but you just hover in the sky and you go back and forth. And uh, through the window, you, you see this spectacular view of, of mountains and this is the tallest one. I took the picture of that is Mount Everest. And this uh, snow covered mountain, they drain into beautiful lakes um, such as the one on, on top left. And this is, um, so I, I must say like, Nepal is hilly, hilly country and we have about eight of the tallest 10 peaks in the world, um, all above 8,000 meters. And we also have like the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, which is about 8,848 meters. So that is almost nine kilometer, right? And I guess you're cruising on an airplane at like 10, 12 kilometers. Um, yes. 
was there was there a question okay i guess not so on the left you see that is tillage lake that's at about height of 5000 meters um and we have a lot of those lakes right and uh so these are typical you know sites you, you see you see in nepal and uh, uh, one of the best parts i guess of of nepal is food we have delicious food and the one you see on bottom left that is uh, we call them momos and um yeah people eat this momos ad nauseum uh, it's it's typical for places in nepal tibet and, and northern india so it is almost like dumplings and you uh pack meat in this dough and and you you uh are are boiling it in steam or you are cooking it in steam right and it's quite delicious if one of you uh, some of you have have opportunity to go to nepal in future definitely try that um so kathmandu that's the capital city of nepal it is situated at the height of 1500 meters above sea level and we call it city of temple you know, we have a lot of uh, temples and, and monuments and you see on on uh, bottom right Uh, these are all the temples um now so that is the recent picture of of Kathmandu and uh, i i want to make a contrast here so on the left you see the Kathmandu valley it's really a valley so you have a lot of mountains around around it and that is uh, on a good uh, day um and this was before we had forest fire and and we recently had forest fire and this guy took the picture from the same spot and the same picture looks like that on the right right so so the vision is really clouded and i guess it's like in africa right during uh, spring and summer you have forest fire we 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 have those two and it doesn't look it looks so nice right uh, uh but it's just to just just to put things in perspective but now because of of rain uh, there is no forest fire anymore and and i guess it looks nice again um so uh to to tell you a bit about myself a bit more about myself i was born in in a small town in the eastern part of nepal um it is almost crazy to think that my my journey started in this place uh on 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 the left um it's crazy to think that because um most people in my town they have dreams to become soldiers right so so during second world war even first world war um so i mean we we have a long we have a history of like you know armies or our our um armies protecting our nation with with their bravery and um they they were fighting right uh, you know in in i don't know 1920s uh, 1940s defending their country against uh, intruders and it turns out the brits they were quite amused by the bravery right and the british government they still to this day recruit um people from from nepal and and they are called gorkhas they recruit people to their battalion they are called gorkhas and a lot of people in in my country growing up they they aspire to go to the uk to become soldier right so that that would be their job right and and they aspire to to do that and we have a pretty good uh how to say edge in sports you know like they they have to be you know good in sports be in army shape right so all they were doing was training to 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 have that dream materialize but yeah i belong to a different circle you know i i probably felt that i was not made to fight <laughs> at the time and i went to this school on uh on the bottom left um it was school that taught courses in in english language that's how i learned english language um and there's a city of taran on on the bottom right taran is the place of my that's the that's my birthplace right and that is what the neighborhood uh, around my my house looks like right so so i i come literally from from there right and after my 10th grade i i moved to kathmandu uh kathmandu valley um again that's on a beautiful day 
just take this photo was taken, I guess, during lockdown where you don't have um, vehicles moving, right? Uh, the air is clean. You get this spectacular scene. Um, so there I got an opportunity to enroll in a school where, where they taught University of Cambridge uh, A-levels. So this, this was a foreign uh, curriculum, uh, quite different from, from Nepali curriculum, and it was pretty rigorous. And I chose regular courses that, that any science student chooses, right? Physics, chemistry, biology, math, and so forth. Um, and yeah, I, I graduated from, from A-levels. And what did I do next? I, I, um, I thought of going abroad. Right, and that's how this whole journey like really started in the, into quantum science because I wanted to get good education in physics, which was my favorite subject during the time. And I um, luckily received a scholarship as well as some loan to study BSc physics in um, Jakobs University Bremen, Northern Germany. And this was at 2011, right? So, so I, I, uh, it was a pleasant opportunity for me. Um, first time in Europe, right? First international flight, like I was, was pretty excited. Um, and so at Jacobs University, I was um, exposed to quantum mechanics and other interesting fields in physics, uh, mathematics, right? Um, electromagnetism, optics. So it, it was quite fascinating for me to, to learn those uh, in more depth and rigor. And um, after I graduated my BSA physics from Jakobs University in Bremen, Germany in 2014, for me, the next logical step was to go to ETH Zurich in Switzerland. It's because ETH Zurich, it's uh, one of the best universities in, in continental Europe. And it happens to be an alma mater of, of Albert Einstein too. He, he, he taught there. Um, I'm not sure exactly if he obtained a PhD degree from ETH Zurich because at the time I think ETH Zurich was not allowed to give PhD degree, uh, right? So it was it was called poly, poly it was a polytechnic university. Uh, I think he studied there but received PhD degree from from a neighboring uh, University of Zurich, I guess. But well, in in any case, it has a strong foundation in physics, uh, ETH Zurich, and um, I. So it was here, right? I was first exposed to quantum computing because I took courses um, such as quantum information processing, um, uh, quantum technologies, right? Um, quantum optics. So it was really here. I, I, I first had real encounter and, and formal encounter into quantum computing. Um, so in this university, um, in the group of Professor Andreas Waldorf, uh, I was given an opportunity to do a small research project, right? And it was fascinating. I was really excited about that. Um, and this lab, um, QDev lab at ETH Zurich, uh, they were working on superconducting qubits, right? So superconducting quantum computing architecture. And that fabricated chip that looks like that, right? So I guess. It was 2015, and at that time, I think they had like four or five qubit device. And um, you see, uh, this is a chip, and there you lay almost lithographically um, qubits, right, which are basically electrical circuit. So you see in this in this chip, uh, qubit one, qubit two, qubit three, qubit four. That is a four qubit device, and all these lines here. Uh, with these lines, you can play with uh, qubits uh, frequency, right? So, so uh, this probably is one of them is microwave drive, uh, which you use to excite and de-excite your qubit. Here, uh, there is a flux line somewhere. I guess this red one, uh, which you use to change the frequencies of of uh, your qubit, and these are like resonators harmonic oscillator which you couple to qubit and that helps you to read out your um, data right so the outcome of your uh, measurement right and um so my task during this research project was 
to um, perform simulations of C phase gate. And what is the C phase gate? It is one of the most important two qubit gates. And actually, I should mention about this three uh, words on, on this um, bracket. So these are three different quantum gates, right? And then we would learn in our university that the C naught gate, H gate, and T gate, they form a universal, universal set of quantum gates, right? So using element from just this set, you can simulate uh, arbitrary unitary evolution. So this forms the backbone of universal quantum computer, right? And the universal quantum computer is based on this idea that, that you can um, perform, uh, execute, or, or implement evolution of arbitrary quantum evolution, concatenating unitary operators from just this set, right? And C phase gate is very similar to C naught gate up to local operations, right? So by local, you mean single qubit operations. So from C phase gate, you would get C naught gate. And this gate was very important for us. And for me, it was quite fascinating to, to, to work on uh, two qubit gate because that is one of the backbone of, of uh, digital quantum computation. So what C phase gate does is if you have two qubits in one, one state, you, 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 perform C phase gate operation on these two qubits, you're going to get phase of minus one in front, right? So, so you get phase of minus one, uh, phase of pi, that is like cos 180 degrees. And uh, it is important to, to accurately get this phase um, of minus one, right? And uh, what I was doing was I was producing this sort of like two dimensional plots you apply flux pulse, you know, to, to your uh, superconducting qubits and you make this sweeps on length of the flux pulse and the amplitude of flux pulse. And you want to be uh, in this red spot, right? So, so I calibrate my pulse parameters such that I'm in the red spot. And to, to perform this C phase gate operation, uh, one needed to wait 60 seconds, or sorry, 60 nanoseconds, right? So after 60, that was the gate time for, for C phase gate. And, and this was a very simple simulation and you would get fidelity landscape and fidelity landscape like this tells you um, how good uh, the C phase gate is, right? So you see if you, if you have like your flux bolt length and flux bolt amplitude to be this and that here, you would get 99.9% uh, .9 is fidelity. And we want uh, our two qubit gate to have as good fidelity as possible. Preferably like 99.999, .999, right? Like five nines. And then we can talk about quantum advantage. So um, this is a very important gate and, and um, uh, scientists and scientists across the world, they're they are trying really hard to get this number close to as close as possible to, to 100 percentage, right? Um, and then our quantum computers will be robust. So that was that was quite quite fascinating. And this is like what, my first real project on, on quantum computing. Um, so but for my doctoral studies, I, I um, migrated a bit from quantum computing, but remain in quantum. Right, so um, I went on to uh, work in the field that is glorified by, that was glorified by Richard Feynman. But it's funny though, because Richard Feynman, I guess was the first person to really endorse, you know, uses of, of uh, quantum computers to simulate uh, quantum systems, right? So there is this connection. So he was a pioneer and made seminal contributions in the field of uh, path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. It is a different way at looking at quantum mechanics, right? So instead of states and wave functions in path integrals, you have like trajectories and paths, right? So if you wanna go from, let's say position X4 to X8, 
you can go like this, you can go like this, follow this red beat, you can go straight. There are infinitely many ways you can take root from x4 to x8, right? So I was working on this path integral formulation of, of quantum mechanics and uh, really understanding chemical reactions that occur in liquid systems. Because if we are talking about chemical reactions that involve light reacting particles such as hydrogen atom, they're small, right? And then they show quantum behavior at low temperature. And I was trying to quantify the rates of chemical reaction using path integral formulation of, of uh, quantum mechanics, right? Um, so that was, that was my PhD in, in chemical reactions. And in particular, um, using path integral, integral formulation of quantum mechanics, I was trying to uh, compute the rate of quantum tunneling, right? So what is quantum tunneling? To, to illustrate that, I will play this movie for a second. Yes. So what is happening there is a quantum particle is coming from the left and there is this energy barrier in black. So the quantum particle hits this energy barrier and it goes through the barrier, right? Most of it goes through the barrier and some of it reflects off the barrier. And in my bachelor's, um, I was computing rates of quantum tunneling by solving Schrodinger equation. Um, but with path integrals, um, we shortcut that route. And when you look at things in terms of uh, trajectories and, and paths uh, for a complex multidimensional system, you can quantify a tunneling rate because solving Schrodinger equation for a complex system is, is an exponentially hard problem on classical devices. So one way to go around was using path integral approach where you don't look at things in, in terms of states and wave functions, but in terms of paths, right? So you sample paths to go from left to right, right? So, so that is what exactly what I was doing. And there is another movie uh, showing a similar phenomena. So you start, quantum particle starts in this energy landscape on the top and goes to the valley, and now it, it uh, tunnels into um, this other valley, right? And now it starts to delocalize. And this is uh, unique to quantum particles. Classically, it doesn't delocalize. It, it follows a well-defined trajectory and um, there is no this delocalization phenomena classical particles show. Um, Right, but but quantum mechanics, it's it's kind of fuzzy and and weird, and you, you see these particles can be in many places at the same time. It can it can tunnel through barriers, and this is a phenomenon that quantum computers also exploit. Right, when you're looking, when you're searching, and this exponential large Hilbert space for for the right answer, uh, qubits they they use tunneling phenomena to to go to um, places which are otherwise not energetically favorable, right? And it speeds up your calculation, right? And so there is some connection there, uh, obviously. And now you, you see there is uh, quantum tunneling in superconducting qubits too, right? And of course, because qubits are, are, are quantum by nature. And on the right, you see a scanning electron microscope image of IQM's uh, quantum processing unit. And here I show two qubits, qubit one, qubit two. And there's this um, small uh, coupler in between. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say small, they're still qubit, but these are called tunable coupler, which are essentially qubit, but we use only qubit one and qubit two to encode our data. Coupler, this, the central qubit acts um, as a mediator to tune the interaction between qubit one and qubit two. 
So you apply some sort of magnetic flux pulse on, on coupler and um, uh, depending on parameters of your magnetic flux pulse, you can tune the interaction between qubit one and qubit two. You can make uh, weak interaction, strong interaction, or you can entirely decouple qubit one and qubit two, right? And that is one important feature of this cou coupler. And this is exactly the, the uh, hardware protocol we, we follow at IQM quantum computers, right? And so these qubits are, are basically an harmonic oscillator and uh, they have well-defined quantum states. And um, these are made out of superconductors, right? And, and superconductors, they, they have uh, Cooper pairs with, with some phase and these Cooper pairs are tunneling uh, across uh, this thing called Josephson junction, right? And, and tunneling is important uh, in superconducting quantum computers. So if we, if we go one step further into this qubits, like I said, these qubits are made up of uh, oscillators, right? And, and you can make these qubits out of um, super, superconducting quantum circuits. One of it is this, this superconducting quantum circuit is shown here, A and C. So A, A is a harmonic oscillator, which is made out of a capacitor and inductors. The capacitor stores energy in the form, form of electric field and inductor stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. And um, now you, you place this, so this superconducting, so these are, these are macroscopic particles, right? Or a macroscopic device. They're not natural qubits in a sense, of trapped ion quantum computer because qubits they're they're defined by nature right you you have ions and they have uh, quantum states and you use those states to define qubits but here we're talking about big huge chunk of of superconducting circuit and it's very interesting you cool this down to almost zero kelvin and they start to behave as an atom you know they start to show quantum phenomena um and uh, you can isolate uh, conjugate variables there, just like momentum and, and position. Um, and uh, you can build it into this sort of quantum harmonic oscillator, right? And you have the levels here, uh, zero, one, two, these are, these are quantum states. And you can define qubits out of the bottom two states, but, but we don't use quantum harmonic oscillator as qubits because they have evenly spaced spaced levels and um, your field, right? Your, your microwave field that resonantly interacts with this two state is also going to interact with this two state. So you're not going to be in computational subsystem, right? So this is going to corrupt your data. To, to um, get around that, uh, engineers, they, they replace this linear inductor by nonlinear inductor called Josephson junction. And now uh, this harmonic oscillator becomes an harmonic oscillator. It starts to show this cosine like potential. And you see now this spacings or this energy levels are not evenly spaced. And uh, in transmons, you, you, use, you use this kind of an harmonic oscillator to define qubits using the first two states, right? And so now qubits are an enharmonic oscillator. They look something like that. It's really a cosine, but cosine also has this type of um, features, right? There's like a valley and peak, valley and peak, but this is not cosine. This is cubic quadratic oscillator. And it's simple to deal with, uh, with your rate theories. And I chose that and with, um, um, the simulation tool, right? I, I developed during my PhD, you can quantify tunneling from this metastable state uh, into this side, right? Across the barrier. So that is the barrier. And um, this is not very important, but you know, these are like lower temperature, these are high temperature. If you're at lower temperature, it tunnels just out of this zero state and you get lower rate, right? If you're at a higher temperature, it tunnels out of this other states and you can tell, right, depending on temperature uh, or, or the current here, if your qubits are in zero or, or one state. But this is not what uh, people in superconducting quantum computer community used to, 
to perform the readout, right? There is another protocol, but but this is interesting to see, I guess. Um, so yeah, at this point, uh, so at this point, I want to tell you briefly about my own company, IQM Quantum Computers, and really tell you about what we what we do there, right? Um, so IQM it's spun out of our Aalto University and Governmental Research Center, VTT in Finland in July of 2019. We develop and sell quantum computers based on superconducting technology. Uh, delivery of uh, our first 50 qubit device, the VTT, is is due on 2024. Um, we we won a tender to build Finland's first quantum computer, and and we're quite excited about that. So our hardware team in, in Finland and in Germany uh, are aggressively working on scaling up our devices, right? So we focus on hardware stack and co-design quantum computers. Um, we develop quantum algorithms hand in hand with this co-design quantum computers. The company is well backed um, uh, by private investment funding as well as public funding. Um, like I said, we have our offices in, in Finland, uh, in Espo, and that's where our headquarters is, and Munich, Germany. I'm, I'm based in Munich, Germany. We celebrated um, a very important milestone uh, as a company on April 1st. Uh, we celebrated the addition of our 100th employee to IQM family. And that's that's huge for us. Um, so now our company's really, you know, going from like startup to, to scale up right at this point, and it's pretty exciting. So um, now we are in NISC era, right? And fully fault tolerant universal quantum computers, they're difficult to build. Um, it's, it's an engineering challenge, uh, scientific challenge, and um, it's quite a way to go, I guess. Um, under digital com quantum computers, what you do, you fabricate your qubits first. And if these qubits are, are superconducting qubits, you lay them almost lithographically right on, on chips and you make it into something like square lattices, right? Uh, just like in Google's quantum supremacy experiment. Um, and um, you you have error correction protocol in place, right? So you make perform syndrome measurements um, on, on your uh, qubits and you detect for different sorts of errors like bit flip, face flip, and you apply uh, necessary unitaries to, to correct for them, right? And then you get error-corrected digital quantum computer. But that is a humongous undertaking and quantum advantage with digital quantum computers likely means one should be around a million qubits, um, and which is a technical challenge today, right? So at IQM, we, we shortcut um, this with our co-design approach, right? Um, so we focus on co-design quantum computers and, and with co-design quantum computers, uh, one follows a uh, top-down approach. Um, you are given a problem and, and you develop problem-specific um, chips or qubit connectivity to tackle this problem, right? So like I said, with standard digital quantum computer, you have qubits, you build uh, square lattices out of these qubits, for example, and uh, you implement single qubit gates, two qubit gates, and you execute this, this gates, right? Um, one by one uh, in, in your circuits. But um, with co-design quantum computers, we, 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 we separate, we distinguish them in, in three levels. Level one co-design, level two co-design, level three co-design. Under level one co-design, you have not only single qubits and two qubit gates, but also the so-called analog blocks. These are entangling blocks which uh, perform interaction, not just between two qubits, but with multi qubits, right? So if you have five qubit, five qubit device, you turn on all this interaction together and um, that, mim that mimics sort of your analog simulation, right? So that, that uh, is going to implement your analog simulation and with that, you will potentially save uh, coherence time, which, which are short on the order of uh, uh, 20 to 
50 microseconds for superconducting quantum computers, and you're going to save save some coherence time there, right? Level two co-design, we build specific um, lattices, right? Lattices made out of qubits for a specific problem. For example, there there might be some problem that works best with square lattice, another problem that works works best with hexagonal lattice, triangular lattice, and so on. And in level three co-design, uh, we use non-qubit element as um, to to, to uh, encode our information, right? We could consider encoding uh, our information, right, in, in qubits. Uh, for example, Qubit's three-level system are bosonic modes, right? So, for example, if you want to perform simulations of of chemistry, right, uh, molecules they have vibrational modes. So why don't you encode molecules, vibrational modes, not on qubits, but on bosonic modes, which which is natural, and you will save invaluable quantum resources to do that, right? So so we follow this approach, and our motto is fast lane to quantum advantage, right? And, and that's what we are uh, gunning for and, and really aggressively ac accelerating uh, development of our quantum algorithms using our co-design approach, uh, which is illustrated here. Um, so we are really building application specific processors. And at this point, so what are, uh, I'll briefly touch on what are the lo low hanging fruits for us, right, to, to tackle? Uh, it would be problems in quantum finance, quantum chemistry, quantum machine learning. And in this front, we optimize our chip topology um, that falls under our co-design approach and execute different kinds of right resource efficient quantum algorithms, right? Um, so at this point, I'll be reiterating myself. So the problem is universal quantum computers require millions of qubits, which are not expected soon. Uh, so what is the solution? So uh, at IQM, we use this hardware software co-design approach for so-called digital analog quantum computing. And this is just one paradigm, right, which we are exploring. And there are others, other paradigms that we are exploring and create a shortcut to quantum advantage. So basically, digital analog algorithm looks something like this. You have not only single qubit or two qubit interactions, but also the so-called resource interaction that um, uh, implies turning on interaction between uh, more than two qubits, right? So you have this bunch of analog blocks and in between analog blocks, you perform single qubit operations. And this way we um, uh, uh, will potentially be, be more resource efficient, right? And we are, Accelerating right development of algorithms in this front, uh, this line of quantum computing, which which falls under our our uh, vision of of co and quantum computers. And so the quantum chemistry um, problems in this field are show inherent uh, exponential complexity. Uh, just just to pick one example out of that that uh, low hanging fruit. So original system in quantum chemistry is often quantum, right? For example, uh, take for example, um, nuclei, right? In, in, in your uh, body, um, they, they have spins, right? If you, if you put yourself in a uh, magnetic field, right? In MRI, you, you uh, have uh, nuclear spins, right? With this Zeeman splitting and they have their own uh, magnetic moment and they couple to, to each its nuclei with this dipole-dipole interaction. And how strong is this dipole-dipole interaction? You need electronic structure or, or some kind of like quantum calculation, right, for that. Um, and on classical devices, uh, the problem is infeasible because uh, it, it has this inherent exponential complexity. So we map this quantum problem uh, onto uh, quantum device. Right, so so you you build qubits and and out of these qubits you create entanglement between different qubits and and this mimics interactions that occur in uh, electronic systems or nuclear systems where where there are entanglement uh, present. Right, and applications include dynamic and static properties of complex materials and molecules, electron transport and transfer processes. Right, uh, quantum sensing. Uh, so there's a myriad of, of applications in, in, in this front. 
and um, we we follow co-design principle, right? And one of the co-design principle would be to use, like I said, non-qubit element, and we have an IP for for this very interesting device, uh, QCR. It is it is made out of superconductor, normal metal, and insulator, and it acts. Um, you could think of it as as uh, uh, environment, right? Right for your for your qubit, and we can use that whole thing as an environment instead of using a lot of qubits as an environment, right? So we follow this principle uh, at IQM to perform uh, quantum simulation, right? Yeah, and, and it's 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 uh, it's been pretty pretty interesting to to get to learn about all these fronts and um, uh, explore explore for us, right? Um, so now. That was application for uh, Europe, right, or, or US, uh, any developed nation. Now, can regions, right, for example, Nepal, Africa, also benefit from this rapidly disappearing uh, quantum winter, as, as we would like to call it? And during one of our weekly meetups at One Quantum Nepal, um, I, I asked uh, our members, right? Where do you see Nepal benefiting from from quantum computers? And and we we jot down like this four different areas. Um, one is this artificial intelligence. Uh, here, uh, quantum sensing, imaging, right? Improving the resolution of of uh, scans, MRI scans, X-ray scans. Another optimization problem, for example, combinatorial optimization problem in, in logistics. And the most important one we found, or, or, or which is pretty obvious, right, would be agriculture. Because um, agriculture provides, uh, I would say, about 65% of Nepalese employment. And that's, that would be area right where where quantum computers once they mature and once they can tackle problems in agriculture right that that would be huge for for places like nepal why because when it comes to agriculture now we are talking about uh, fertilizers right and and production of fertilizer i guess i'm not an expert but you have this so called fritz haber process which is pretty energy thermodynamically um, unfavorable process. So it requires a lot of, lot of energy to catalyze the reaction. And we, we haven't found, I guess, good catalyst, right, to, to do it in the most efficient way. And let's say quantum computers, like in 10 years, right, or, or 20 years, you know, big ones, maybe we will be able to discover a good catalyst uh, to produce fertilizers that are energy efficient, more env environmentally friendly, right, um, and, and that would that would uh, massively benefit benefit us. A lot of activities are also going on here in Nepal, especially in the field of AI. We don't have good MRI uh, machines, but we do have X-rays, and and people use machine learning algorithms to to enhance the quality of of X-ray scans. Um, so here we can potentially think of quantum computers helping, right, in the in the context of quantum sensing. In MRI imaging, so I think there is a lot to look forward to. But again, we are still in a baby phase with quantum computer, and gradually uh, we are getting there. And um, hopefully, right, we, we will soon have a quantum advantage in in cases which are useful, uh, and, and that could potentially change change all of our lives. Um, yes, with that, I want to thank you all. For, for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm open for that now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manish. That was beautiful. That's a beautiful story. And uh, I like how you, you weaved everything into it and uh, gave us a, a full picture of what has been happening. So feel free to unmute yourself and come through and ask Manish any questions. Uh, you can perhaps stop sharing your screen so that we see people who are in the room.
All right. Yeah, All right. if that works for you, that would be great. So yes. Okay. I, I like that we've got Stanley from Bolivia, we have Alexandru, we have uh, uh, Takura, we have Abdul, and... Uh, There's a question, Chetra I think. Pao, and uh, yeah, Abiska, yes, Ishmael as well as Dorcas. So, well, thank you very much. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and come through with your questions, if, if any. Otherwise, I've got a lot of questions for Manish, but I, I don't want to. Yes, nice. Stanley and then Ishmael. So Stanley, can I meet yourself and ask, and then we have Ishmael. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation, first of all. Well, I want to ask to the present um, one question about the kind of business uh, that he is managing. Uh, what kind of customers are you currently working on selling these uh, uh, machines. These customers are from the private side or also are from the government side? That's so, that question. Right now, research. Yeah, that's a good question. So IQM, uh, we, like I said, we won tender to build Finland's first quantum computer. And we are selling uh, uh, our 50 qubit device to um, this research center, government research center called VTT in Finland. So we are focusing on research centers, um, university labs, right? Um, so, so these devices are like 50 qubit, 100 qubit devices. Uh, these are prototype quantum computers and, and we sell them, uh, for example, to, to research centers. Okay. Um, Ishmael, yes, we can come through. Uh, thank you. Um, that was a very excellent presentation. Um, quite um, eye-opening. Uh, I really liked it. Uh, just a question uh, for Benish. Uh, possibly there could be two. Uh, the first one is, um, okay, I'm, I'm from Zimbabwe in Africa. Um, and uh, in, in our part of the world, people actually uh, coming to understand now uh, what quantum computing is and um, its application in different industries. So, my, and so in, in that regard, uh, the, there's been uh, certain groups uh, trying to approach some um, and conscientize, conscientize some, say, universities, uh, some policymakers to really uh, understand uh, quantum computing. My question is, um, how amendable are you possibly uh, working with an entity, say possibly from Zimbabwe, I'm looking at possibly uh, University of Zimbabwe or uh, Midland State University or one of those universities so that um, these students get to quickly appreciate and uh, re experience um, a quantum computer. Possibly that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the first question. Possibly there will be a follow-up question after you've answered it. Yes. Um, so we are talking about accessibility of quantum device for uh, students in Africa. And that's a very interesting question, right? Because the whole point of uh, One Quantum and One Quantum Nepal, One Quantum Africa, this community is to make this technology accessible. So it, it falls exactly on the line that, that we, we follow. And um, so putting it, putting it in cloud, you know, you see companies like IBM, they, they put this quantum devices in, in cloud. Um, That's one way to, to uh, get access to these devices, right? And um, there are like a lot of, lot of ways to, for, for students in, in Zimbabwe to, to get involved for example, uh, through, I would say, for example, you know, like a hackathon, right? Um, and the like other other areas which where you, one can participate, you know, in, in, in and and learn uh, about other devices, you know, that that are currently in place. I would say, I, I guess that did not answer completely your question. Yeah, perhaps. Um, 
Perhaps yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come in there and say, for sure, like, like what um, Manish is saying, that's exactly the reason why we're building a community. And um, I think we've got a number of routes that we can take and that we have already taken. Like last time when we had Strange Works, that is the idea to improve accessibility of, of resources. And um, getting universities and uh, communities and small local communities to, to participate, perhaps it's, it's about uh, them more than the opportunities. So when we, we make quantum popular and gather communities like this, that is exactly what we're trying to, to, to figure out. If ever we knew somebody from MSU, somebody from UZ who's interested to take this forward, we, we know what to do and we already have opportunities to do that, I guess. Uh, and it's just a matter of perhaps exploring how that can be done. I'm not sure if that makes it any, any easier. <laughs> and perhaps you could go with your follow-up question and another question coming out of this to, to manage, that's okay. I'm sorry for coming through, but I thought I could clarify a few things. No, I think, I think that's quite important because um, I was having a chat with my, my former uh, doctor uh, for my first degree uh, at use it. I won't mention his name because I'm quite certain that some of his students are in this group. Um, mm -hmm. But you see, uh, he really didn't understand what quantum computing is. But then uh, he's one of the key decision people at the university. So I was just trying to bridge that particular gap in the, um, in this, so, because you uh, see. I would also perhaps come in and say, before we did all this, um, for me personally, I've, I've reached out to the whole community in Zimbabwe. Uh, not perhaps the whole and everyone, but remember I come from NAST, uh, I've, I've got colleagues at UZ who are even lecturers, who are people that I studied with. And there's always that friction point because it's, it's not a field which uh, perhaps everybody else will be quick to, to run uh, and, and uh, um, you know, show some proficiency in. Uh, it is just like another facet of technology. You realize that even in computer science, there may be lecturers we have not uh, kept on you know, abreast with the new technology such that uh, in machine learning, they may not be very active but they're in computer exactly. science. So we, we've got that gap. I, I think another way to, to look at that would be, right now we are um, at a stage where quantum revolution, right? Like let's call it second quantum revolution. It's, it's unfolding. Um, and we haven't had useful quantum advantage, right? So, so let's see our machines get bigger and you know our algorithms get better, and and we reach at quantum advantage to our supremacy to do something very useful for society. Then people will start understanding this better and more. I would say um, uh, confusion lies in the fact that now we, it, it's early, right? Like now it's it's already accelerating, but still early. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'm answered. Right. Do you have okay. do you have a follow up question? You promised one. <laughs> you know, actually, I end up getting answered um, through your intervention and Manish's intervention. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks for that. Yes, um, thanks. Docas, let's hear from Docas today. She she has been attending our meetings uh, for a number of times now, but we haven't had a a voice. If you are free, you could come through. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you joining us from? And you could ask a question or make a remark, whichever you prefer. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity as well to join the sessions. I'm from Ghana. And currently, I'm in Canada, University of Calgary, uh, on a research visit at the Institute of Quantum mm -hmm. with them. And I'm new in the field as well. So I'm still learning from everyone and from across the board as well. So, I mean, basically that's what I would say. And I'm happy, I mean, that's one quantum for Africa as well and bringing everyone on board. So I think the future 
clothes writer for ads. And I'm actually excited to have chosen this field. Uh, because for some years, when I started a PhD, I've been doing quantum, but I didn't even know which area of quantum I really wanted to do. So I was just doing quantum with math and all that until, I mean, I came on my research visit and my supervisor is in quantum computing. He has the team and all that. And last year, because we were home, I took the IBM program on quantum computing. Then I enrolled in the qubits by qubits uh, computing at the world. So it's been great. And I might say I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the whole thing. Yeah. It's Sounds good. good. I, I yeah. love that. Uh, love your story. Yes, Manish. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying I'm glad that it's been fun for you so far with, with, the, with this technology. Sure, and we thank you for, for joining us as well, for, for the support and for thinking that perhaps we are on something that is worthwhile. Uh, Manish, I, I want to ask you some of the questions we ask, you know, people who usually join us, our guests, we, we think they are, they are very you know, knowledgeable about certain things and they also have got interesting ideas uh, about how we, we can answer some of the questions we come across each and every day. So, what roles exist in, in, in quantum today? And where do you see the gaps in terms of uh, careers? Because Africa has a lot of young people, what they want are jobs in quantum. So to make that real for them, what job opportunities do you see? And where do you see uh, people contributing? If somebody wants a career in quantum, how should they, mm -hmm. how should they approach that? Yes. Quantum computing is, it's almost like, uh, it's like Lego, right? Puzzle and it's amalgam of disciplines that span a wide range, you know? So so you have somebody like um, me who, who has physics background, right? And then quantum, quantum mechanics, which, which I understand. Um, physics, that's, that's very important. Uh, others, chemistry, why? Because like I said, you know, we have a lot of uh, quantum chemistry applications that quantum computers are seen or, or we believe that, that it can tackle. Uh, people in finance, right? Now look at this, this disciplines, right? They're, they're very different from each other. People in, I don't know, cryptography, you know, pure mathematicians, engineers, right? People working to build uh, chips, um, people working in electronics, you have like software developers, right? Because we need software stack too. And and sometimes, right? For example, people that work in quantum computing company and that work as a software developer, sometimes it's not even needed for them to understand quantum computers or quantum mechanics, you know, because there is this whole, this department where, where you work on software stack and there is hardware department where you literally are, are fabricating your chips, right? And there is also a field of like uh, cryogenics, you know, building like this fridge, ultra cold fridge. So I would say, you know, it's a really vast field and it touches on a lot of people's discipline, you know. Uh, but it is always nice to understand some quantum mechanics, right? Because it is founded on principles of quantum mechanics. Okay, sounds good. So um, as a follow-up question, since I've been told by Ishmael, you always want to bring two questions. Um, in a case like Ishmael, where you are talking to other physicists, they are your, your, your classmates, they are your peers in industry, and they are not uh, aware or um, interested in quantum, or maybe at least aware, let's call it awareness. How would you approach such a conversation? Imagine I'm the one who has gone to the University of Zimbabwe and I'm speaking to the Dean of Science or the head of Department of Physics and they haven't taken up quantum. What would that conversation look like? Just you know, speculatively. I don't expect you to have perfect answers for that, but let's be we're thinking together on it. I think it depends on what your motive is. 
Uh, so you want you, you want them to take up quantum. You want perhaps the, them to understand that it may be a very important technology for the future, and it's important for students to know their choices. It's not like everybody should do quantum, but you want people to know their choices. Mm -hmm. So you just want uh, an opportunity to expose people in in the schools to for them to say, okay, we think uh, let our children or our students or our staff know its existence in case they are interested. Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. I let's say I want to convince somebody or the dean of, of school it is important, and you put that on curriculum, right? Um, well, I would say all we can do right now is sell the promise, right? Um, because uh, a lot of fundamental uh, theoretical work has gone into. Um, making an estimate about where this device can be useful, right? You already have algorithms like Grover's algorithm, you know, for example, right? That that searches uh, this unstructured database and, and you see at least on theory that it provides a quantum advantage there, right? Um, so I guess we can point to, you know, really simple algorithms like that you know, which, which are well established, even though not necessarily executed for, for like huge problems, right? But this, or for example, the promise of provably secure uh, communication, right? Um, and, and technologies that quantum computers can tackle, right? Like you know, encryption, right? Um, there are like well-established uh, theoretical framework built built for that, and one day we might realize that, right? And uh, I'll just point to some of these examples. And then, of course, you know, we have made massive progress in in on the hardware side, building devices, you know, rapidly, you know, 50 qubit device, 100 qubit device. And, and we keep going, right? So we are making progress on engineering front. And, and when we reach to a certain number of qubits, those problems, you know, that are relevant will be realized, you know? Uh, yeah, that's that's what I would say. Sounds good, sounds good. So yeah, as well as uh, come together and uh, start building on something and work at the community aspect, bringing education to people, uh, you know, being part of that journey where we are figuring out how quantum is going to be applicable in our lives. And I guess that will show results as well, that there are people are working at it. So either way, people in the communities are also going to learn of its existence. I'm happy now we've got people who know Ishmael and others, especially in Zimbabwe, who are involved in one or two conversations with people who think they are experts in physics and in computers, but don't know quantum computing. And these are the guys who are introducing you to them and say, yeah, yeah, we've got a community and we've got a platform and there are things that are happening today and here and now. <laughs> so maybe that's another way to, to just show progress and say, whichever way it looks like we are at least, you know, working at it and this is what we're doing. It. It's up to people to be part of it or not. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, Gilead, uh, Abdul Malik, Takura, if you've got anything to say, otherwise we are a bit beyond time and we just wanted to thank you guys for joining us and you get yeah, yes. if you've got anything. Yes, Abdul. Yes. Uh, so uh, I've, been, I've been a bit away because uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a business incubator right now and uh, the, the building is a bit busy. Uh, sorry wow. for that. Yeah, so uh, uh, I don't know exactly what you guys have been talking about, but uh, I have uh, just one thing that I want to hear from Manish is uh, what type of steps do you have there uh, in terms of uh, building uh, the community as, as you see it? Like, uh, did you make uh, some sort of a plan? Like, uh, did you make some, uh, you know, did you point out those, uh, those problems that the community are facing? And then you're just uh, looking for what are the solutions? Tell me your, mm -hmm. your perspective. Right, right. So one one of Nepal, um, that is, <clears throat> that's our community for Nepal, right? Where we want people to be involved in, in this technology, 
Um, I would say people are very curious, especially people that graduated high school. They're very, very curious. Um, one of the biggest challenges is the fact that quantum computing or quantum technologies, these are very complicated to, to understand uh, for, for young people with no formal training, specifically on quantum computers, right? So it could happen that after a few discussions or, or a few of these weekly tutorials, meetups, they, they lose track or lose interest. And one should be very careful uh, about that. You know, one should take very slow and one at a time. So that is one important challenge. Um, I would say that is one of the most important challenge, uh, at least for the Nepali community, right? Um, another is access to information because information on the internet, right? Young people, they like to browse the internet and look for different materials. They're pretty fragmented and, and we need some sort of structure, you know, uh, in, in literature like well-structured documents where they can learn quantum from, right? Um, not fragmented and not all over the place. Uh, so really well-structured for, for the beginners, you know, I guess that is also lacking. Uh, and I give tutorials, weekly tutorials on, on some basic stuff. And they also get to ask me questions, right? So proper, you know, like interaction with, with experts um, and them getting to know, them getting to ask questions, you know, and have this discursive thing going on, right, where they can freely ask questions. So that is also missing. So we need proper networking, right? So they need to be networking with, with experts in the field uh, more, I would say. Yeah, that is two things that comes off the top of my head at this moment. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I, I can I can in a lot of your thoughts because uh, uh, here in Libya where I live, uh, there are actually a lot of uh, a lot of things in common. Uh, one one of those things is that uh, the community where, has sorry, where Libya, is it? Libya, yeah, in North Africa. Bolivia, okay. In Libya, yeah. Libya. Yeah. Sorry, Libya, Libya. All right, all right. I heard Bolivia. Sorry. Okay, no, yeah. So what I was uh, what I was pointing at is that uh, the community here, uh, once they hear quantum, they all go like, uh, no, quantum. That's uh, that's very complicated. That's uh, that's that's pure physics. Uh, but uh, we're actually starting a movement here uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, one year or so. Uh, and recently, it's been it's been a it's been a really good work from uh, from the team that I've been uh, I've been working now with. Uh, especially, they are uh, they're actually engaged uh, engaged more in the, into the uh, IEEE students uh, branch here in the University of Tripoli, uh, which is the capital of uh, Libya. Uh, there there are a lot of there are a lot of people interested, but they see it as it's very far far away technology that is that is, that is not available right now in uh, in our countries. Uh, this is this is their this is their vision for the for quantum computing and quantum technologies. Uh, my own idea is just to to make it possible for them that uh, they believe in quantum that is not just coming, it's it's coming very fast. That we will never, you know, we would never catch up with the whole world if we don't start moving now. And uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the whole vision for the, for mm -hmm. the I, I think, communities. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty that's a pretty impressive in, initiative. Um, uh, from from your side, um, and and I agree. Uh, there is some fear about the technology and and the fact that you know the the thing okay is not changing our lives now, right? Uh, and that's why I say you know we we are getting there and we have a useful quantum advantage. Um, it'll be easier for us to convince those people. Yeah. Sure. So it sounds good. So anyway, thank you very much. I think uh, we. But a bit beyond and I really appreciate all your time. And for those who have time, I shared the link for the cocktail party for those who can join. Uh, it's in the chat. So let me know if 
if you've got issues via email, because sometimes the platform is difficult for one reason or another, but uh, otherwise I'll give you moments to copy the link. I we realized last time I perhaps closed the meeting without people getting access to the link. So you can get your link now or uh, hit me up on email and I'll send the link to you directly. And uh, yeah, hoping you have time, extra time to, to chat in, in the cocktail. I know Manish may not be able to do it. He's got other things coming up, but thank you very much Manish for your time today. Really appreciate it. Beautiful discussion, beautiful presentation. Thank you everyone for attending. Let's keep connected on the other platforms and keep moving quantum forward. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, the meeting ends here and thank you very much for making it happen. Yeah, thanks to you Farah as well for organizing it. My pleasure, always, thank you. Thank you.